Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa. And today we are going to be talking to you about having a well-stocked pantry, how to create a well-stocked pantry. That's what's up next. Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead. Come along with us on our journey from a small suburban homestead lifestyle to our new lifestyle homesteading in the rural countryside of Southern Arizona. We'll share with you our tips, tricks, successes, and failures from both our past suburban lifestyle to our new rural lifestyle, all on the Two Acre Homestead. Okay. Well, I am without my usual sidekick, which is my husband. And that's because Kevin, my husband, is working on a project and he is unable to join us today. So we will catch him on the next episode, which actually, as a side note, is our season finale. I can't believe we're we're ending a season already here um, with our podcast, but we will be back after um, a few weeks and um, we'll be ready to go with new topics and a host of new things. So stay tuned next week because we are going to be talking about what to expect in the new season. But Onward and upward. Let's see here. I think onward and upward really applies to what we're going to be talking about. And that is the price of everything, whether it's food, whether it's anything, everything has been going up. Um, The cost of everything has just been skyrocketing. And so I know a lot of people have been wondering, well, how do you create a well-stocked pantry? Well, I have some ideas that I think will help you to create a pantry that is well-stocked with the things that, and this is my first point, the things that you eat. Okay. I know there's a lot of people out there that will say beans and rice, beans and rice, beans and rice, beans and rice. Okay. But if you don't eat beans and rice, there's no point in purpose of having it on your pantry. Um, take it, you know, take it from me. If it's something that you don't eat, just don't buy it because it's not worth it. Um, stock the things that you and your family eat on a regular basis. Now, if you're coming from this, from the perspective of, well, I do a lot of going out to eat. Okay. This is my recommendation because I've had somebody say that to me not too long ago. Um, Just recently, somebody was talking to me and they said, well, you know, we eat out a lot. And I'm like, well, step number one, stop eating out. But Step number two, write down the things that you eat when you eat out. And the reason why you want to do that is because you want to learn how to make those things from scratch from your own pantry. So for example, this particular couple that we were talking to, they said, well, they they love Chipotle and they love to eat Chipotle all the time. Well, okay, then what you need to do is figure out what do you order from that restaurant? And okay, so, you know, like I think one of the the spouses said, well, that they eat um, the chicken burritos. So, um, and they have like all these specialized toppings. I said, okay, fine. Start stocking up on chicken. (laughs) Buy chicken, put it in the freezer, you know, um, or before you put it in the freezer, what you want to do is cook it similar to how Chipotle would cook it. 
and then put it in the freezer. Then figure out how they make their rice. They make a fantastic rice that we actually love as well. Um, I think it's called lime, cilantro lime rice. Learn how to make that and either put that in a freezer or better yet, buy a couple of 50 pound bags of rice from your local, you know, Costco or Sam's Club or, you know, any big box store like that. Buy some rice and get yourself some food grade buckets and store the rice in there. And then you'll always have rice. So, you know, if you're coming at this from that angle that, you know, you're going out to eat all the time, figure out what you're eating at those restaurants, learn to cook that food, and then learn to, you know, put that food on your pantry in such a way that you can use it so that you can cook it at home. And I think you'll find that there's a lot of health benefits and there's a lot of financial benefits to doing that. But let's keep moving on. So when you're talking about getting a well-stocked pantry, I think what we need to define is what is a pantry? A pantry can mean a lot of different things. Most of us think of a pantry in in the sense of like a, a food closet. So, you know, this extra storage room, um, whether it's a, a true closet or a walk-in pantry where you have dried and canned goods on a shelf. That is a version of a pantry. But there are also other pantries to think about. And that is your freezer or freezers, if you have more than one, your freezer is a form of a pantry because it's preserving food. And so that also needs to be addressed in this conversation of having a well-stocked pantry. And of course, there's other different ways of storing food, but for the sake of this conversation and for the sake of this podcast, we're just going to stick to those two ways, those two methods of housing food. So for the walk-in or closet style pantry, that's where you're keeping, again, your dried goods and your canned goods. Here's my recommendation. Again, Go on Amazon, go to a store, um, some of the big box stores in the, in the bakery section, they may give you um, either for free or extreme discounted price, they may give you food grade buckets. That's step number one. And the reason why I say that's step number one is because you need a place to keep the food from critters and from anything else that may come in and destroy the food that you are trying to save. So I highly recommend people to always like things like rice, things like um, beans, sugar, things like that. Um, Always try to keep them in food grade buckets. So that's step number one. Have a place to store those dried goods. Step number two, obtain (laughs) those dried goods. Step number three, buy canned food. Now, for some of you, this is probably going to rock your world. I am saying go to your store and try to buy canned food. Now, I have a pretty well-stocked pantry of tin canned foods. And I do that very strategically because 
I have lived, literally, I have lived this and I have seen this with my own eyes. When we lived in Phoenix, Arizona, where the temperatures are like 120 plus, we lost power two times in a row. And the home canned food that I had, the seals broke because of the heat. So I have learned my lesson from that. And I always have tinned canned food because in the event that you have an extreme heat weather event or extreme cold weather event, that food that's in the tin can will make it. The food that is in your home canned jars, if you're into canning, may or may not make it. But how do you get those items into your pantry? And how do you do it without breaking the bank? Very simple. What you want to start doing is do little increments at a time. So when you go to the grocery store, instead of buying two cans of pinto beans, get three cans of pinto beans or four cans of pinto beans. And that way you always have one for a rainy day and one for just in case. Um, So in other words, you're having extra. And then that's where your pantry management starts to kick in because I know for myself, I have a certain number of um, like a certain quantity where I get to a certain quantity of, of an item and I say, that's my cutoff period. When I've gotten to that quantity, let's say I'm, I only have two cans of pinto beans left, just as an example, then I know I need to go to the store and buy three more cans of pinto beans. So you put a limit to how low you want your pantry to go. The other thing that you want to look into, sticking to the example of pinto beans, instead of buying a whole lot of the tin can version of the pinto beans, try the or uh, try to buy the dried version of that food. So beans are a perfect example. It's so much more inexpensive to buy dried beans than it is to buy the canned beans. So if you're buying the dried beans, what you want to do is you want to, you know, when you buy those, those, that big bag of beans, then you want to put that in, again, here's where the food grade bucket comes into play because then you can put that in your food grade bucket, seal it up. And now, you know, nobody, you know, no animal or anything like that is going to come and have a field day with your canned beans or excuse me, your dried beans. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking to build a homestead from the ground up? Or maybe you're looking to build an off-grid dream home, a vacation home, or maybe just a piece of land to call your own. Visit yourcheapland.com to buy rural land in the wide open spaces of southwestern United States. When you visit yourcheapland.com, they're here to help you. And with their help, you can do this. You can take your dream of owning land and make it a reality. Most down payments are only $294, including the document fee. Remember, everyone qualifies for financing at yourcheapland.com. Head on over to yourcheapland.com and start making those dreams come true. 
And now, back to our podcast. Another thing that you can do that may or may not be more or less expensive. And that is, there's a, there's a trick. I used to do this a long, a long time ago. Oh, edit that out. I used to do that a long time ago. I don't necessarily do it as much now because I grow a lot of my own food. But when it comes to your fruits and your vegetables, try dehydrating them. If you have access to a dehydrator, perfect. What I would do, I would go to my grocery store and I'd buy those big bags of frozen veggies. All you need to do is stick those frozen veggies onto your dehydrator trays, let them dehydrate. Once they've dehydrated down, put them in a glass mason jar. And as a side note, that's something else that you want to buy for your pantry for storage is mason jars. You can put your dehydrated food in the mason jars and either put like a an oxygen absorber in there or, um, you know, like some sort of silica a gel type of um package just to keep things fresh and you've got um you've got perfectly dehydrated food that is shelf stable so and what I would do with that is I would use that in soups and stews um sometimes I would take some of that not just for soups and stews but just rehydrate it back and feed it to the family So there's a ton of different ways that you can use food like that and make it shelf stable. Um, But that's just one, that's just one thing, one way of doing it, um, especially if you have access to a dehydrator. But let's say you don't have access to a dehydrator, then leave it in its frozen state. Make sure you are rotating things out of your freezers. Now, if you're not into canning and I'm, I'm talking in a way that I'm indicating, you know, maybe a person's not into canning. If canning, pressure canning is not your thing, then the freezer is probably your best bet. One thing I like to do in my freezer is when I get meat, when I go and I would buy meat, sometimes, um, especially like if I had like, for example, ground pork, I would take that ground pork and I would cook it before I froze it. So that way, let's say if I wanted to make my own breakfast patties or, or breakfast sausage or if I wanted to make my own hamburgers, I would cook all of that stuff first, then freeze it. And when you put it in the freezer, make sure that you've gotten all of the oxygen, as much oxygen out of that bag that you possibly can. If you're using a standard Ziploc style bag, pro tip, Put the food in the Ziploc bag and then start, start to submerge the Ziploc bag in um, some water. With the opening of the Ziploc bag up, so you don't want to get any of the water in the bag, in your bag. But what you're using is the pressure of the water to make all of the oxygen get out of the bag. And just as the water reaches the very top of the bag where you're going to seal it, that's when you seal it before any water comes in there. And you've got a perfectly sealed bag without any air. Throw that into your freezer and use it when necessary. 
use it when you need it. Just like with anything, whether it's a uh, closet style pantry or if you're using a your freezer, you want to make sure you are rotating your products. Use the oldest ones first and rotate backwards that way. So if you just bought, let's say, for example, you just bought a bunch of ground beef and you've cooked said ground beef, that goes in the back of the freezer. The ground beef that you had from, you know, four months ago should be more towards the front for you to use. So that way you're, you're in a good rotation. Purchasing things in bulk is also a really good way to start having a pantry. That some, for some of you, that's really going to be a shock to the system as far as um, the financial cost because it's it's different because you're buying something in bulk. So you're going to feel like the price is higher, but in reality, it's not. Let me use, for example, um, we buy in bulk from different places. So we buy in bulk from Country Living. We buy in bulk from Azure Standards um, and a few other places. And one of the things that we we laugh about is we buy our olive oil in bulk. Now, if I just went out to my local Walmart or my local grocery store and I bought organic olive oil, it would take, for the same price of what I'm going to pay for, let's say with Azure Standard, I would have to buy a larger quantity um, of olive oil. I'd have to buy more to reach the same price as the big bulk item that I buy from Azure Standard. All of that to say, it comes down to unit pricing. And that's something that you really want to be aware of, is what is the unit price? So like, for example, when you're at a grocery store and you're looking at the price tag, look at, there's another thing on there that will tell you, you know, per either per quantity or per pound, per measurement, whatever your measurement is, it might say what that cost per unit. That's what you want to shop. Not not the price, not the label price, but the unit cost. How much does it cost um, in units? Because when you're starting to price things out that way, when you buy in bulk, then you realize you're actually saving money because you're spending less per unit, but you're just buying more of it. I hope that makes sense. Um, but really pay attention to your pricing. And of course, always pay attention to your sales. Always, always, always. Although this day and age, I know for myself, I haven't seen very many sales, but I haven't been in the grocery store as much here recently. But, you know, try to pay attention to your sales and try to buy little bits at a time. That may also mean that you have to switch things around with your budget. So maybe, you know, look at your budget and see, is there something that you can do without? Is there something you can cut back on? For example, if you're still going out and buying coffee, I'm just going to use it as an example. You're still going out and you're buying coffee every now and again, or you're going out to eat. You know, for a family of four to go to a fast food restaurant, you're talking about 30 to $40. Can you cut 
that out at least once in a while because you can take that foot that same forty dollars and you can buy yourself some rice and beans. You can buy yourself some canned carrots. You can buy yourself some frozen veggies. So switching around your budget, cutting things out that you may not need and diverting that money to having a more well-stocked pantry is really beneficial for you and your family in the long run. And the reason why that's so beneficial to have is as we've all experienced as these last two years, <coughs> as we've all experienced these last two years, lockdowns, sickness, job loss, the list goes on on and on and on. So when you have a well-stocked pantry, let's say, for example, if there's a job loss, your husband or whoever the breadwinner is of the family loses their job. When you have a well-stocked pantry, well, groceries is one thing that you can remove off of your list. So make sure that in your pantry, you have the things that you would need. Could I go without going to a grocery store for one month, two months, three months? Those are things that you want to think about. Um, another way to have a well-stocked pantry is growing your own food. I cannot tell you how important it is. Hand to soil, grow your own food, whether that is your... um you know, whether you're growing in raised garden beds or you're growing directly in the soil or you're just growing on pots, there's a lot of things that you can grow in pots. You know, whatever it is, try to produce some of your own food because by producing and preserving that food, now, you know, you're able to stock up your pantry for pennies, pennies on the dollar, maybe even less because you're growing it yourself and you don't have to worry about, you know, the price increase because there is no price increase in a garden. <laughs> there's no, there's no garden inflation going on. Um, there's no, there's no inflation inside of your garden. So when you have hand to soil, and you're growing your own food, and especially when you're growing it from seed, I cannot express that enough. Try to grow from seed. Because when you grow from seed, you really are spending spending pennies on the dollar. Now, we just did a podcast last week about um, homesteading inexpensively. And I talked a lot about, you know, you don't need a raised garden bed, but you know, you can just dig directly in the soil and plant a couple of seeds and let them grow. You don't even have to do soil amendments. I think on that podcast, I said, if you know, you wanted to spend some money, then I would do, you know, some soil amendments, but you can just directly sow your seed in ground, let it grow and see what it produces. And if it produces, well, you're just ahead of the game. Um, and if it doesn't produce, you haven't lost anything but a couple of seeds. So try to produce your own food wherever possible. That is the best and easiest way to fill up your pantry. And the other thing that you want to consider is preservation methods. So how to can, dehydrate, salt, ferment, um, just all different types of preservation methods. Try to learn some of those. Don't be intimidated. Just give it a try. Um, I know a lot of people get intimidated with canning. Canning is a very, very accurate science. Um, it's, it's 
I've been canning for years at this point, and I can tell you I have had failures in the past, but I've had more and more successes than I've ever had failures. And when you have failures, believe me, you know about it. Um, and canning is safe as long as you follow the instructions and the recipes that go with it, you should never have a problem canning. So if your budget allows for it, try to see if you can get some of those preservation methods, um, maybe a dehydrator or a canner, um, and learn a new skill because those things will help you to put food on your table and in your pantry. Well, those are a few of my tips and tricks as far as getting a well-stocked pantry. Again, little bits at a time, buy multiples of things that you are going to consume. Stop going out to eat, stop going out for lattes, Try to consume food at home. And don't forget your freezer is also a pantry. So frozen food, frozen vegetables, rotate your food, and by all means, try your best to grow your own food. Oh, there is one more thing I did forget to tell you. That is, if you don't have access to grow things yourself. Try going to what's called you pick farms. You'll have to look it up either in Facebook or some social social media or just straight up Google. But go to a you pick farm. A you pick farm is basically a farm that opens its door to the general public and says, we have, you know, X, Y, Z available for you to come and harvest yourself. Let me tell you, I love Yupik Farms because that is a very, very inexpensive way to fill your pantry. It requires work. It requires hustle. um, And it requires you to know how to preserve that food. But if you can do that, if you're willing to get up and harvest and preserve the food that you pick, you for, again, pennies on the dollar can fill your pantry with food for your family. Um, highly, highly recommend you pick farms. Um, I know there's many of you that are listening from other parts of the world, and I don't know what they're called in your neck of the woods, but I know at least here in Arizona, and I know in the south, um, south, the southern, uh, southern half of the United States, they are called you pick farms. And, um, yeah, just look it up because you put the work into it, you harvest it, you preserve it, but it's usually very, very inexpensive. And that also leads me to another thought, and that is see if there's any other farms or community supported agriculture, or CSA, um, any other version of that in your area where you live. Um, Because oftentimes you can get that food at a deeply discounted price. And, um, you know, again, it requires some work on your part because now you're going to have to learn how to preserve that food. But at the end of the day, isn't it worth learning how to preserve that food so that you can put it on your shelf? It's food that you have preserved and it's food that 
now is going to feed and nourish your family. Isn't it worth the work? So I hope that these tips and tricks help you to create a nice pantry for you and your family, especially with the cost of everything going through the roof. Well, that's it for me and my family. And so we hope that you, this podcast finds you and your family doing well. And until next time, stay safe out there.